All right. So I, th this is kind of the weird thing with being the, uh, the guy with the eldest sons on camp property. So it's kind of like, hey, hey you want to do father's son, right? Um, my eldest son is three. Um, so, so when it comes to being a father, uh, I don't have nearly the experience of you guys, but I do have a lot of experience being a son. And uh, so, so there we go. And uh, that, that, that's my street cred. Um, now, uh, what I have here is I have six blobs of foam, all right? And uh, yeah, you know, because props and stuff. And uh, so I've got a blob of foam. I, I sanitized my hands before I took these out, if it's comforting. I can't say I sanitized it recently. Why do I have a sixth one? Who did I not give one to? Oh. So this is, uh, this is, this is uh, modeling clay. Uh, it is a foam that basically you can shape. And then after about 48 hours, it pretty much sets permanently into whatever you've, you've done with it. And uh, so I want to use it as an illustration uh, as we go through a little bit of stuff tonight. And uh, I want you guys to think of it as we, as we go through it. So you got to think of clay. It's been sitting here for a little bit of time, so you'll notice it's already kind of starting to harden into a, a specific mold, but you can still shape it. Uh, from experience, within that first hour of having this, uh, it is going to pretty much set, um, but again, depending on how thick it is and, and where you put it and stuff, you are going to have a few hours to, to mess with it before it finally goes into its permanent shape. It, it's really fun. Uh, they use it for costume props, so like um, adding accessories onto like your armor and stuff so you can paint it. I want you guys to kind of remember this, this adage, this, this saying. You need to shape it when it's soft, or you'll need to chip it when it's hard. Okay, so I, I, I want you to think of that, that little mantra, that little saying, you need to shape it soft or you're gonna chip it hard, okay? And I want you to think about that because tonight I wanna, I was thinking through what are my memories growing up? What are the things that stuck with me? Um, I don't have a ton of experience raising kids. I have three, but they're all three and under. So I don't, I don't have like a vast uh, array of experience. I've been a teacher for a long time. I've run teen camp for a long time. I've taught Sunday school for a long time. So I've had a copious amount of experience with kids that both have good parents and bad parents. So I've seen the good and bad. But I thought through, from a, a child's perspective, what are the things I remember? My, uh, and so I, I want to, as we shape this clay, I want you to use it as a metaphor for your kids. All right, so I'm speaking at least initially directly to the dads. I want you to think of the clay as your kids. You got a very short time to shape them before they harden up and then you're pretty much stuck with what you got. Again, that, that old mantra of shape it soft or you're gonna have to chip it hard, okay? Once that thing sets into a hard spot, you cannot shape it anymore and you're probably gonna have to take a knife to it to, to get it into a shape you want it, which is obviously painful and, and not something you wanna do. But there's three M's that I wanna leave you with tonight. And if, if you're one of the kids, I want you to listen to this because I want you guys to think through what is something your dad has done in this little section that you remember, okay? So the first one is moments, okay? Uh, literally, there is a book. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read it, I would highly suggest doing so. Uh, it was the first Audible book I ever took advantage of and got it for free with an Audible account. Uh, but it's the first book I ever got on Audible, and it's called The Power of Moments. And what it is, is it's a whole book that just gives random, crazy illustrations of things that make moments stick in the minds of people. So the, the illustration that, that pretty much anyone who talks about this book is going to bring up, it's an illustration right off the bat, and it's a hotel down in, I think, Southern California, and they literally have a popsicle telephone near their pool. And at any moment while you're hanging out at the pool, you can call up this number and someone will come by and bring you a popsicle. And it's just like a completely random thing, but it gets this hotel like rave reviews because it's just random enough and unique enough and it makes you feel special enough that people love it. And it's something that like, it, it's a ho-dunk, like not too nice hotel, but because they have something like that, it just brings everything to the next level. And as I was thinking through my own childhood, I, I just, I want to tell you a few stories of things that happened in my life that have stuck with me for my whole life. 
Okay, the first one, my, my parents and I used to take a trip to Florida. Now, we grew up in New Hampshire. So from New Hampshire to Florida was about a 26 hour drive, which we would do in pretty much one sitting. And I almost mean that literally. Uh, you, it was like, we'd stop for breakfast and dinner, but dad would always be grazing on stuff at lunch, so we would almost never stop for lunch. And uh, so it would be like, we would leave at midnight, we'd get there sometimes, you know, midnight, and uh, it was just, that's how we rolled. But I remember one time, what we would do is we would go to, to Florida, we would hit a theme park or two, uh, we'd stay in a hotel, I'd hang out in the pool like the whole time because I just like to swim. But I remember this one time, completely random, it was some evening, we were driving around, and my parents stopped at a go-kart track and bought me a, a ticket to, to ride the go-karts. It was just me, it was me and my parents, like my brothers had moved on at that time. To this day, I don't know why we stopped at the go-kart track, I don't know what, like, I don't know if I asked, but all I remember is driving the go-karts by myself, because I was like the only one on the track, having a grand old time, and my parents were standing on the other side of the fence just watching. I don't know if they were filming it or what they were doing, but it meant, like, at the moment, I didn't realize the significance of it all, but for some reason, that moment has, like, stuck with me forever. Like, it, it's still, like, I vividly remember just driving around the go-kart track for whatever reason, and it was something that was unplanned, it was something that was special, it was something that was just something they did for me. I, I still remember another time uh, we were driving to Florida, and uh, we blew a tire. You know, and that, that's one of those spontaneous events that you could panic and freak out, but we actually made it fun because uh, we had been driving and it was a construction site and just something went wrong and the car broke and so we were just hanging out on the side of the, the road until we got help. And I just remember like standing there. I, I remember, and this is, this is going to play into another point, I remember one time I was having a really hard time. It was when I was in college and I was being a little more emotional than normal. And I, I remember my dad looking at me, and he, he said something that has, like, again, it stuck with me, but it was a little s expression that changed my direction. And he said, wow, you're really high maintenance, aren't you? And, and coming from a dad, it was like, oh, I, well, I, I don't want to be high maintenance. I mean, that's, I, I, ugh. And I, I took a little bit of, like, offense to it, but it's something that stuck with me. It was just that moment, sitting in the kitchen, I was freaking out about some stuff, and my dad just looked and was like, you're being high maintenance. And there have been a few of those moments through my life that they linger. For, for good or bad, sometimes I mimic them, sometimes I, I don't. Um, it, it wasn't something that my parents did, but another instance that I vividly remember is I remember standing in the gymnasium of my school and we were playing indoor soccer. And we had been told, don't kick the soccer balls against the wall of the gym. And obviously, when you're playing in a gym, sometimes you accidentally do it. And so I kicked the ball. My, my, uh, my method of playing defense when I played soccer was just kick the ball as hard as you can, and it goes all the way to the other side, and you've successfully defended your goal. I, I had no strategy other than as much power as possible get this thing out of here. And so I kicked the ball, and it went all the way to the other end of the gym and hit the wall. And I remember one of my teachers, hey, don't kick the ball against the wall. And I, I tried to defend myself by saying, I, I didn't mean to, it was an accident. And the teacher standing next to him was like, <laughs> and I just like, I remember as, and I, I think I was in senior high, so I was probably 11th or 12th grade. I just remember like losing all respect for that teacher. N not that I honestly had a whole lot of respect for that teacher to begin with, but it's something that's just lingered with me where I, when I became a teacher, had to be extremely careful that I didn't do that because it was something trivial that that teacher probably never remembered he did. But for some reason, that moment of having a teacher go, <laughs> when I was trying to explain myself, it just shut me down. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care about anything you have to say from here on out. Like, I'm, any rapport you had, I'm just done. And so those are just a few of those moments, those, those instances where it's something spontaneous. It's something that comes out of your mouth on a, a spur of the moment, or it's something that's very calculated that it's like, I'm going to make this special. That is a way you, you shape. Now, we won't take stories right now, but think about your parents. Think about your dad if you're sitting next to him. Think about moments that have really meant a lot to you 
and I hope you guys take a moment to talk about those things. So that's kind of a challenge for tonight. You, you've got that clay, you've got that foam. And I want you to think about the different ways that you could shape that foam. I mean, really, if you, if you apply pressure to it, that's obvious way of applying, you know, you shape it by squeezing it. But if I took out something hot and I messed with it that way, I could shape it that way. If I froze it, I could shape it that way. Uh, honestly, <clears throat> what I see a lot of parents do is they use gravity to shape their foam. If you're following the illustration, gravity is basically the, I'm gonna just put it there and just see what happens. And I've seen a lot of parents who, who it, it, this was the, the grievance of being a teacher. I, I often joked that I would have liked to be a teacher for orphans because their parents made my life so miserable sometimes that I would have much rather just, just give me children and I'll teach them. But like, it's the parents who honestly always got to me. But there was this one, one parent who, he really liked the Bible and he really liked biblical things but I could tell by the way his children acted and by the way he acted that he wasn't actually carefully shaping his children. It was basically the method of, I'm going to leave the children there, let them do whatever they want, and every now and then I'm going to come along with the Bible and just go, Pwah! and then, and then I'm going to leave for a while and do my own thing, and I'm going to come back, and, and then if, they're not, if it's not shaped the way I want, I'm just going to go, Pwah! to the point where some of his kids would eventually be like, hey, Dad, why don't you just go away and go read your Bible? Like, that was... That was what one of the kids said to him one time. I mean, it was like, uh. And, and that was the idea of gravity, just shaping the kid. He let the kid run with whoever they wanted to. He gave the kids what they wanted. He, every now and then, like I said, came in and just kind of smacked him with the Bible. But as I watched, he wasn't really living it. And so those are this idea of, of moments. It, it's the intentionality. It's the intentional picking up and saying, I'm going to apply pressure just like this. I'm gonna do this specific thing. I'm gonna set it aside here so it can harden, so then I can pick it up and shape it a little bit more. But I'm not just gonna leave it. And I'm not just gonna randomly come in and go and, and I'm personally extremely thankful that I had a dad that didn't just leave me. He was very specific, he was very intentional. Um, Mike, you should ask your Sundays, if any of your kids are in my Sunday school, ask them about the Star Wars sticker story, um, which is just a case of my dad being very intentional. So the first one I would, I would challenge you with, are there moments where you've been intentional or moments where your dad's been intentional with you? Think about that. The second one, I'm going to use this word. I, I realize the word comes out of Hinduism, but bear with me. It actually has a common uh, language use now. Uh, but in Hinduism, uh, when you're trying to meditate, you use what are called mantras. Okay. Nowadays, the word mantra just basically means a saying that you keep repeating to hopefully memorize it, like it's, it's something that sticks. Um, but the original meaning of mantra would be like the weird like noises that you make to help yourself meditate. You know, like, um, um, you know, like that, that weirdness. Um, so I'm not saying to do that. So when I use the word mantra, I'm using, what are those expressions that your dad always used? All right? One of the ones my dad would always say is uh, when I would mess with him, he would look at me and say, don't let your mouth write out a check your butt can't cash for you. You know, which was his way of saying, I, I'm, I'm stronger than you, so just be careful. You know, and, and that was his way of basically warning me, be careful. But on that vein, I, I was the type of kid who would always mess with the bully. Because I wasn't really afraid of the bully. So, but I was small. So, it's, as you imagine, you mess with a bully when you're small, you get beat up a lot. And so my dad would get on the bully's case, but then he would turn right around and say to me, don't you provoke. Because he didn't want to have any more work to do, but he would say, don't you provoke, like, don't give them an excuse. He'd stick up for me, but then he'd get on my case for giving them an excuse because I, I was a brat. All right. Uh, another one that my mom used to always say, and this is just lingered, she used to always th say things like, die in private. And, and I'm not saying you necessarily need to follow these. I'm just saying these are sayings that my parents passed on to me that stuck with me. And so if you see me showing a lot of emotion, it, it might mean that something's really bad happening. All right? Because, again, my parents were just of this attitude of like, hey, you know what? You, you're having a really bad day. You don't have to wear it on your face. But you, you know those guys who are like, and you're like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, nothing. Well, your face looks like you just got shot with a, a lemon. And they're like, I'm fine. 
uh, and you're like, no, dude, what's, what's wrong? And they're like, nothing. It's okay. I don't need anyone. And you're like, okay, what's wrong? Nothing. You, you run into those people, I'm sure. And, and those type of people don't breed a whole lot of confidence. Like, you're not like, hey, I'm going to go to that guy for some emotional support. You're like, that guy's kind of making me nervous. Uh, you know, and, and that was just one of the things that my, my mom wanted to get across to me is, hey, you know what? If, if you're having a really bad day, you, you don't have to show everyone. You just go, go die in private, which is extreme sounding, but it, it's not as bad as, as it is. Now, why do I bring up mantras? Well, in the Bible, this, this is a sermon. In the Bible, God talks to the children of Israel, and he says specifically to them, what I want you guys to do with this Bible is I want you guys to put it in a little box on the doorpost of your house. And I want to use it. He says it's, it's, it's going to be frontlets between your eyes. So I want you to imagine a saying that is like right here. Would you have a hard time forgetting something if it was like right here? Okay. I mean, you'd, you'd be like, what is that thing blocking my vision? Oh, yeah, that's that saying. And, and the Bible says, like, the truths of the Bible need to be so ingrained in you that they're like this. It's like you're going to walk out the door of your house and you see something on the door and you're like, what is it? It's a reminder. And, and, I, and I hope that in your house you have scripture around. You know, we have a, a big, big verse, right? Like, it's practically on the roof of our, of our house. And it's just this big, long verse about being thankful and being joyful in the Lord. And it's right there. And so every time I sit on the couch, I look up and it's like, boom, right there. And it's a constant reminder of that's how I'm to behave. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And so if you're having like a really bad day and you're like, oh, life is tough. Nobody cares about me. And you sit down and you're like, oh, huh. that verse, right, right, right there. And that's what, that's what the Old Testament was telling the children of Israel to do. It said, hey, you need to write this upon the doorpost of your house. You need to put it like right there so it's in your face all the time so you see this and remember it. And have you ever noticed that the Bible has some really, really, I'm going to use the word pithy sayings. All right, I hope you know what that means. You know, it, it's the idea of, of extremely catchy sayings. Like you read through the Proverbs. And, and some of the statements in Proverbs might be just a general truth. But it's, 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 memorable. It, it's memorable. And, and so the challenge I would have for you as you shape your kids and as you even allow your parents to shape you, have those sayings. Have those expressions that you can go back to to say, remember, ba 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 and, and so one of the ones that I'm working on with my kids right now, uh, and, and I can't say it's original to me, I, Deb more or less came up with it, I think, but it's this idea of choose to obey. And I want you to think about the importance of something like that, something, that mantra, that saying, choose to obey. Because what it is, is it's a really simple statement that's easy to remember, but it brings up a really important truth, which is, one, you have a choice, and you need to make the right one. And so as you're coming up with these sayings, they, they have to be short, obviously, so you can remember them. But, but they have to have some depth to them. I, I was looking through, just, just for fun, I was looking through this afternoon, what are some mantras that people have? And I found an Oprah Winfrey site. And uh, it was filled with like 20 mantras you can use in your own daily meditation. And I'm like, great, what are these? And it's like, you are good enough, and you should love yourself. And like, it was just those type of things, and I'm like, today is going to be a good day. And I'm like, well, it might not be, actually. So maybe that's not the best thing to be like, you are good enough. No, you're not. Uh, you know, like, so make sure as you're developing these, make sure they are in line with scripture. Um, <laughs> so say them to someone and see if they give you a weird look, because... Uh, <laughs> Who knows? And, and so those, that, that's another way that we shape our, our kids. It's another way we're shaped. It's the sayings. It's the expressions. And so the first one we covered was, was those moments, those, those special moments, those things that are done, uh, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, but being very, very careful that those moments, you never know which ones are going to stick. Like I said, the second one are those mantras, those, those sayings, those little conversation points. And then the last one, it, it's a story. I'm going to call it the, the messages, the, the narratives, the stories. 
For this one, I actually want to look at an extended passage, and it's, it's in John chapter 13. It's in John chapter 13, and uh, I believe, I don't know that John's going to this specific passage tomorrow, but the idea is definitely going to come out, I believe, tomorrow. But I want to read this story, because in John chapter 13, Jesus, uh, we, we around here joke that Jesus was the first camp counselor. And the reason we say that is because if you've ever been a camp counselor, you know there's things that you tell your campers that they don't get right away, and you just keep hammering it, and you hope that somewhere down the road they'll get it. So in John chapter 13, it says this, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the, this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them until the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and was going to God, he riseth from supper, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel and he girded himself. Now, now one of the things I really, really like to do during uh, specifically science camps and some of those when I get to preach, I like to just tell the story of the Old Testament. And, and so I don't know if you've ever preached that way or taught that way, where you just start telling the story. And so in this case, if, if we were telling this like a story... It's, all right, so Jesus is coming up to the end of his life. And think about what happens to you if you're thinking, I'm going to die soon. What are, you, what are you doing? I mean, you're probably doing the most important thing you could possibly imagine, right? Like, you're, you're not wasting time. You're not like, hey, guys, I'm going to go surf the internet for, like, if you knew, like, I'm going to die tomorrow, you're probably not wasting any moment at all, right? And so what Jesus is doing in this illustration is Jesus is coming along and he's saying, I'm going to do the most important thing I possibly can right now. I'm going to put all my effort into this one super important task. And you know what he does? He dresses up like a servant, gets down on his hands and knees, and starts wiping the poop off of someone's foot. Because that's basically what the job of the servant was. Back then, they would walk through the dirty streets. And so they'd have you know, mules and camels and all of that. And so you think about how dirty and nasty and gross those streets were. And Jesus comes along, and the lowest of the low jobs of servants in that day were to wash people's feet because they wore sandals all the time. And so I want you to imagine Jesus, all right? He's about to do one of the most important things because it's what he does right at the very, like, this is like one of the last things he's going to do as a group with his disciples. So he's going to teach them, like, the most important lesson before he's not with them anymore. And what does he do? He puts on the dress of a servant. He gets down on his hands and knees. He grabs their foot. He grabs a water basin and he starts rubbing all of that nasty road stuff off of their feet. So he takes the first guy. And I want, I want you guys to imagine this. Like, here's Jesus. He takes the first disciple and he just starts wiping their feet. You think if you were a disciple, you'd be a little bit confused by what's going on? I mean, just, just a little bit? You're like, what? What is happening? Like, what are you doing? And, and you can see this in the narrative, because what happens is, one of the disciples says, no, 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 you're, you're not washing my feet. No, no, you can't wash my feet, because it was a degrading job to do. It was nasty. It, it was not something that you wanted to do. Uh, I, I made the joke to Deb earlier, and I, I know I've said the word poop like three times tonight, but it's, I have three children who are three and under, and two of them are potty trained, so it's, it's on my mind. All right? But earlier today, I was watching the children, and one of them stepped in it because for some reason it was in the front yard because they're little kids, and I don't know what happens, and we have bears and turkeys, and so it's just gross. And so I hear screaming from the front yard, and I have to come out, and I have to start cleaning up after that. And somehow they had taken a toy rake and gotten the toy rake in it. And so I had to take the toy rake and flick it off into the woods without touching it as much as I could. And then I had to take care of the boots and I had to take care of all the other, it was gross. And I smell it almost constantly these days. All right? And if you're a dad, you understand what it's like to be constantly cleaning that type of stuff. And you understand as a dad what it means to be a servant in that way. Now, as a kid, you were three, or you were two. You don't remember. But what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, I'm going to show you the true example of a servant. Now, like I said, it's that story. 
It's an illustration. It's a picture. But I want you to understand, you know how I joked that Jesus was the first camp counselor and that they didn't get it? Look at the rest of the, the, the story here. It says this, After that, he pours water into a basin, so he, he's got a bowl of water, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And so he has a towel that he's wearing as, as a piece of clothing. So he's using his towel to clean their feet. And look what it is. Then he comes, then comes he to Simon Peter. Now Simon Peter's one of those guys who always said what he was thinking. Like he just spouted it off, all right? And some of you are that way to your parents. You're, you're the talker. Some of you, you know which, which kid it is, who's the talker. All right, I have, like I said, I have three kids. One doesn't talk at all, because you know he's half a year old. Uh, the other one, I don't understand pretty much a word he says, because he doesn't speak English yet. And then Drake, she talks a lot. And you walk into the house, like, no, daddy. And I'm like, I didn't even do anything. What are you, okay. Uh, you know, and it's, it's like being yelled at by a three-year-old. And you're like, at least you're, you know. But, but it, it, we, we know which one of that in the family is the talker. Peter is the one in the family that's the talker. And look what happens. Peter says, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? He's basically saying, are you going to wash my feet? Like, are, are you washing my feet? And Jesus says, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Okay? Can I, can I finish the story with this? Here's what happens. Jesus comes up to Peter. Peter's sitting like this. And Jesus comes up and starts washing Je uh, Peter's feet. And Peter's like, are you going to wash my feet? And, and Jesus looks at him and says, you don't understand what I'm doing. You'll get it later. You, 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 don't, you don't get it right now. Someday you will. And he just keeps washing his feet. Now remember, I talked about those moments. I talked about those moments where you do something, and it's a, it's a memory. It's something that sticks with them for a long, long time. The, the one, like I said, that just stuck with me from my dad is that moment, sitting in the kitchen, I'm freaking out about stuff, and he says, wow, you're being high maintenance. And it stuck with me, and, and I didn't get it at that moment. But as I went through the rest of my life, I was like, yeah, I don't deserve any better. Yeah, I, I don't deserve people fawning over me all the time. I, I, don't, I don't need this. And my life became a reaction to that comment to say, I was, but I don't need to be that anymore. And what Jesus is doing is he's looking at Peter going, you don't get it, but you will. And he was just consistent in doing what he needed to do. Now look at what Peter does. He goes to the other extreme. He says, well, well, uh, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And he's like, fine, fine, wash all of me. So, so again, he's that, he's that guy who doesn't understand balance. He's like one way or the other and extremes. And Jesus is just like, Peter, all I need to do is wash your feet. That's enough. And I just find this really cool because what the Bible will do repeatedly is it will tell us stories. And, and the stories are true, and the stories are things that actually happen to people. But by telling a story, it lets us know, oh, there's more to this than I, I realize. Oh, I need to think about this. If you ever study out Jesus' parables, there's depth to those things that you're like, oh, I got that one now. And I was listening to a podcast today, and there was a part of a parable I'd never understood. And a guy mentioned something about it, and I was like, I never thought of it like that. And I've studied all these things. I, I, know, I know that story. And there are little bits that you constantly pick up on later and later and later. But that's the power of a story. And so as you shape your kid, or as you let yourself be shaped in that case, are you shaping with moments? Are you shaping with those mantras, those saying, those memory hooks? Are you shaping with messages, these stories that are going to stick? And as I finish off, I think there's two main ways that we do this, and one is by provision, provision of resources, provision of help, provision of all that. I think the other one is something my parents ingrained in me. They, they told me when they were raising kids, they had no idea what they were doing, and they said, we just prayed constantly. And I think as you provide and as you pray, you shape that kid, and you not only shape the spiritual, you shape the physical right alongside and that's how you shape the kid. You work on it. And like, like the clay, 
If you were building anything out of clay that was really, really big, you have to make sure you support it. You have to make sure you're constantly going back and reinforcing those things. Otherwise, the moment you let that clay ball out, it's going to go, and gravity's just going to take it back over. I'll leave you with one other illustration my dad used to always tell me. And he was one of those people who sheltered us as kids. Didn't over-shelter in my opinion, but he sheltered us as kids. And he'd get a lot of flack from other people at church for it. And he said, listen, if you're dealing with a young tree, you don't just let it grow however you want it. You put stakes around it, you put a fence around it, you, you anchor it up so it stays vertical until its trunk is strong enough, and then you can start taking some of those supports away and the tree will stand on its own. And that was kind of a saying. It was also a story. It was an object lesson. And it was that little illustration that he used in his own mind to say, this is why I'm going to protect my kids. This is why I'm going to put barriers. Because they're like a young little tree. And I don't want gravity to just do its thing. I need to fight against the force of gravity. I need to put it up. I need to support it. I need to structure this thing. When it's old enough and strong enough, I don't need these fences anymore. I can, I can start taking them down. And so I hope with some of these illustrations, I, I, hope, I hope they're an encouragement to you. I would give you one more passage to look up on your own. Look up Deuteronomy 8, 2. And look at how God uses stories. Look at how he uses moments. Even look at how he uses sayings. But in Deuteronomy 8, 2, you see God at the end of the wilderness wandering, specifically bringing up some stuff that he brought them through. And all of it is just saying, hey, don't forget that. Remember that. I'm going to put it in little sayings because you're going to forget. And so I hope you'll take the little clay ball. I hope we'll play around with it, shape it, kind of get a feel for, for how you shape something like a clay ball. And you'll notice that if you leave it out overnight, it'll pretty much be hardened into at least the shape that you can't undo without ripping it a little bit. And so that's why I end you with, you got to shape it when it's soft. Otherwise, you're going to have to chip it when it's hard. And uh, so that's just some stuff I learned from my dad and uh, some stuff I hope to ingrain in my children, but I am not arrogant enough to say I'm, I'm good at it. Um, but it's, it's something I've learned. So anyway, uh, we'll pass it back over. Uh, Mr. John, if you can...